We all know that the Orioles traded Trey Mancini on Monday, but today let's learn about the other part of that trade, the return for him, as we learn more about the right-handed pitchers, Seth Johnson and Chase McDermott. Plus, recap an Orioles win over the Rangers that gives them a sweep in Texas, their first since 2013. That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, August 4th, 2022. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to take a look at the Orioles' return for Trey Mancini. They got two pitchers in that deal, which was a three-team deal with the Astros and the Rays. From the Rays, they got right-handed pitcher Seth Johnson. And from the Astros, they got right-handed pitcher Chase McDermott. And we've got two guests coming on the podcast today to talk about those two guys. First, we'll hear about the Rays and Seth Johnson from Matt Germain, who covers Rays baseball and has been on this podcast before. He'll also tell us a bit about Brett Phillips as well. And then Spencer Morris will join us, who has also been on this pod before, does a great job covering the Houston Astros minor league system. He'll come on later in the pod to tell us about Chase McDermott. And then first on the pod before all that, we'll recap another Orioles win as they sweep the Texas Rangers. But that's all coming up on this episode. But first, just want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. Make sure to like and subscribe wherever you can, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or right here on the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. Make sure to hit that red subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. Thank you, the listener, for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. For your first listen today, let's start with an Orioles victory. Orioles 6, Rangers 3 on Wednesday afternoon in Arlington as the O's complete the three-game sweep over the Rangers. And after kind of a rough weekend losing the series in Cincinnati, they back it up with a three-game sweep over the Rangers to get to 54-51 and 51 on the season. The Orioles go a perfect 6-0 and against Texas this season, and it is their first road sweep against the Rangers since all the way back in 2013. And a really interesting part about that is when the Orioles completed that sweep in 2013 over the Rangers in Texas, who started that game for the Rangers? Martin Perez. Who started Wednesday's game for the Rangers? Martin Perez. Things uh, just seem to come around like that at times. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 6-3 to three win over the Rangers. And the first thing you need to know is that, well, this apparently was the Robinson Chirinos game for the Orioles. Of course, a day game after a night game on Wednesday when Adley Rutschman generally either gets the day off or DHs. And he was the DH in this one. And, and don't get me wrong, he produced in this game. Adley did not have a hit, but drew three walks in this one and scored a run. But Robinson Chirinos, who got the start behind the plate and hit ninth for the Orioles, he was the offensive star. Chirinos goes three for four in this game with a home run and two RBIs and two hard hit balls. Listen, it jumped his batting average only up to 168 on the season. It has been a real struggle for him offensively this year. And frankly, he hasn't been very good defensively. He had some really bad misses framing-wise behind the plate in this game. But he came up huge. And of course, the big swing came in the top of the seventh with the game tied up at one run apiece. He unloaded off of Matt Moore for a long solo home run into the upper deck in left field to give the Orioles a two to one lead at the time. We haven't seen Chirinos contact a baseball like that in a long, long time, but it's 104 off the bat travels 407 feet for the solo Homer, just his third of the season to give the Orioles a two to one lead. And then he added more in the top of the eighth inning, getting a big insurance RBI single to put the O's up four to two at the time to give him three hits on the day. Now for Robinson Chirinos, only his second three hit game of the season. The other was June 18th against the Tampa Bay Rays when he went three for four with two doubles and four RBIs in that game. And for Robinson Chirinos, he had three hits. It was his first game that he has played in in the month of August. He had two hits all of July. Chirinos was two for 22 in the month of July, and he is now three for four in August. Nice little day for Robinson Chirinos. 
Second thing you need to know from this one is that Taryn Vavra strikes again for the Orioles. One day after he got on base all four times on Tuesday with a single and three walks, he did not get the start in this game, but he gets the biggest hit of the day for the O's. With a runner on second, and two outs in the top of the eighth inning and the game tied at two. Vavra comes in to pinch hit for Tyler Nevin against the Rangers right-hander Jose LeClerc, and he delivers an 0-2 fastball, just wrecks it into the left center field gap for a go-ahead RBI double that put the Orioles up 3-2. Ended up being his only at-bat of the day, but it was a huge one for Vavra, who then stayed in the game and finished the game defensively at second base. And listen, he's been really impressive. So far since coming up over the weekend, I think it's almost about time for the Orioles to make that change. Now, I don't know if it's time to necessarily DFA Rugnet Odor, but Odor has been really struggling lately. Vavra looks good. Vavra, of course, is a left-handed hitter, plays second base. It seems to be just a better option for the Orioles. I said this on Twitter. He's kind of a different hitter than the Orioles have. You know, a more patient approach, more of a hit it the other way, a singles and doubles guy, really good bat path, bat control. He's just very patient, knows what he needs to hit at the plate. And the Orioles don't have a lot of hitters like that. So he gives the O's lineup a little more balance when he's in there. And I definitely think it's time for, you know, I think Odor should stay on the team. He gives them good vibes and he's a clutch hitter and still provides power and veteran leadership. And he can still play a, a pretty good second base defensively. But I think Vavra needs to take over Odor's role as kind of the starting second baseman and let the kids play. And he is certainly one of the kids who is playing well right now. Third thing you need to know in this one is that Kyle Bradish wasn't dominant, but he certainly had his moments and gave the Orioles a chance to win this game. Bradish with the start, his second one back from the injured list. He allows just one run on three hits over five innings, strikes out five and walks three, throwing 93 pitches, lowering his ERA to 6.55 on the season. Now, just four hard hit balls against Bradish in his five innings of work. Listen, the pitch count was up 93 through five, and that's been an issue all year for Bradish. Rarely has he pitched into the sixth inning. But the one good thing was, despite three walks, they all came in the second inning. After he had had a long first inning, allowed an RBI single, and, and gave up a run in the first, he walks the bases loaded in the second, but gets out of it, puts up a zero, and then did not walk anyone for his next three innings of work, got the strikeout numbers up, and listen, 12 whiffs, a pretty solid number on 48 swings, seven of them came on the four-seamer, three on the curve, and two on a really nasty changeup. And again, you know, he was... Fastball dominant, it was 55% four-seamers to just 18% curve, 18% slider, and 9% change-ups on the day. I'd like to see him throw more breaking balls and less four-seam fastballs. I talked about how I'd like the curve and the slider combined to uh, be thrown more than the four-seamer. That did not happen, but his four-seamer was working with the seven whiffs, and you know the velocity was, as usual, 94-96. He gave the O's a chance. I love his stuff. And I love that he's back in the rotation. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that the Oriole bullpen was a little shaky, but still did enough to get the job done. After Bradish left the game after five, Brian Baker entered in the bottom of the sixth. It was a 1-1 game, and he again struggled with command, allowed a hit and a walk in the inning, recorded only one out with a strikeout, had to leave the game. Dylan Tate comes in and allows a hard hit ball Got pretty lucky with first and second and one out. Jorge Mateo makes an incredible play to turn a slick double play to end the inning. And then Tate comes back out in the seventh after Robinson Trinos' home run had given the Orioles a two-to-one lead. And he gets the first two batters on one pitch. And then he just hung an 0-2 changeup to Jonah Heim, who laced it into the first row down the right field line for a solo homer to tie the game. But, you know, CNL Perez came in, kind of pulled things together with an inning and a third scoreless with a strikeout. And then, listen, Felix Bautista, it wasn't a save situation, but the O's got two in the ninth, so he came in with a 6-2 to two lead in the bottom of the ninth. And he was nasty. All three of his outs were via strikeouts, but he did serve up a home run to Marcus Semien as the Rangers got one back in the ninth. So, you know, Perez was good, but Baker, Tate, and Bautista just a little shaky at times, but still, they did enough to get the Orioles this win. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 6-3 victory over the Texas Rangers is that Brett Phillips made his Orioles debut on Wednesday. Now, he did not start this game. It was Ryan McKenna who started in left field and actually opened the scoring for the Orioles with a solo home run in the second inning, just his second of the year that tied the game at one. But then Brett Phillips came in and actually pinch hit in this game for Ryan McKenna in the seventh inning. Phillips got two at-bats. He actually struck out in both of them, but 
He did stay in the game defensively and played the final three innings in left field. Of course, he gives the O's great defense in the outfield, a great pinch runner, you know, speedy base runner and a really good base runner as well. And a veteran who brings good vibes to the clubhouse does Brett Phillips. But, you know, you have to ask yourself, him and Ryan McKenna kind of play that same fourth outfielder role. And frankly, although Brett Phillips has a lot better track record, Ryan McKenna has been a much, much better hitter than Brett Phillips has all season as McKenna, you know, delivered with the home run on Wednesday. So we'll see what the plan is long-term. Phillips did replace Yusniel Diaz, who of course made his major league debut Tuesday night with a pinch hit strikeout and was sent right back down to AAA Norfolk as uh, Phillips took his spot. You know, Mike Elias talked to the media on Wednesday, talked about Kyle Stowers being pretty close to ready. They're having conversations about bringing him up. So maybe Phillips just a placeholder for a week or two until Kyle Stowers gets to the big leagues, but we will see what his role continues to be moving forward. But of course, Brett Phillips acquired via trade on Tuesday at the deadline for cash considerations from the Rays, the only big leaguer that the Orioles acquired at the trade deadline this week. But they did trade away two of their most important players, and one of them was Trey Mancini, who they dealt to the Houston Astros in a three-team deal on Monday. And the Orioles got two pitching prospects back in that deal, one from the Rays, right-handed pitcher Seth Johnson, a top-10 Rays prospect who just Wednesday did undergo Tommy John surgery. And then you have Chase McDermott, a top 10 Astros pitching prospect who has some really, really high strikeout numbers in high A. And we're going to be joined by two guests to talk about each of these players to kind of evaluate the return that the Orioles got for Trey Mancini. So first up here, we're going to be joined by Matt Germain, who's been on this podcast before, does a great job covering all things Tampa Bay Rays. He's going to tell us about Seth Johnson, how good he's been before the injury, why he waited so long to get Tommy John, and what he could be like for the Orioles when he returns from that injury. And then later, Spencer Morris is going to join us, who does a great job covering all things Houston Astros minor leagues. He's been on the pod before as well. We're going to talk about Chase McDermott with him, the high strikeout numbers, the walk issues he's had, and uh, how high his ceiling could be when he gets to the major leagues. But first, before we get there, I do have to tell you about BlueNile.com. Because whether you're ready to pop the question or you are just looking for a everyday piece to maybe celebrate a special occasion, Find jewelry as unique as your person with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. They have simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting style. And Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft a perfect engagement ring. And if you're having trouble or need to answer or, or, or get your questions answered, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7. So make your moments sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile Anniversary Sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. All right, so Matt Germain has joined us back on the podcast. He's been on here before to, I believe, talk about Nick Shufo the last time uh, we were chatting. But... This time a player who, or really two players, who I would think will make more of an impact than Nick Shufo did with the Orioles. And Matt, first of all, thank you so much for hopping back on the podcast. No problem at all. My pleasure. And so, you know, we're here to talk about Seth Johnson, who the Orioles acquired uh, the day before the trade deadline in the three-team deal that got the Astros Trey Mancini. And it was an interesting kind of finish to the deal because it was initially reported that it was, you know, the Orioles and the Astros were dealing Mancini for pitching prospects. And then, you know, all of a sudden you see the Seth Johnson name and you realize, well, the Rays are involved too. They get Jose Siri in this deal. So let's start with Johnson because obviously the headliner for him is that he's about to get Tommy John surgery. Now I know he hasn't pitched since May. So I think the question Orioles fans are asking is what has happened since May to now and I guess kind of the question is why hasn't he had the TJ surgery yet? So I think like if you follow a lot of the uh, Masahiro Tanaka and, and those kinds of, you know, rehab forever sort of scenarios where they define PRP injections, things like that, that can kind of help them along and, and try to mitigate the issue without going through Tommy John. I think that's usually something they look at. I don't know why it took as long as it did. Maybe it's just Seth himself was undecided. Um, I can't think it would be the Razor doctors wanting to take that long. But uh, 
there, there, there's something in there that says that there was a possibility that maybe it wasn't quite completely torn and then in the end when he tried to ramp it back up or, or get things going again it probably didn't feel right so he decided to just go at it yeah and and we figure that probably don't see him back on a mound in games that matter until 2024 you would have to think especially with his prospect status you know usually takes at least a year that takes you to next august the orioles are probably going to push him to 2024 I, I i would think you would agree that we probably wouldn't see him until that season starts that's right what i would say the encouraging part is that if you look at the generally you know 16 17 months they're ramping up and that'll take them right about december 2023 so that 2024 season will be a regular spring training he'll be able to ramp things up regularly and, and have a really normal year so in theory and, and he was double a ready when when the rays you know were about to promote him basically before he went down so you could have him in double a to begin uh, 2024 and then see how it goes and, and knowing the O's and, and how they're, you know, they've been having a lot more success recently in developing arms. He, he could theoretically make it up to the Orioles by the end of 2024. Yeah. Uh, I mean, things go well. So that's encouraging. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, he will be 26 by the end of that season, but you put a, a giant asterisk, you know, when he has the Tommy John at the weird time he's getting it, you know, you basically, he basically is going to lose two seasons. Uh, yeah, because yeah. of, of, you know, going through the rehab, but let's kind of get to, you know, the pitcher he was before the injury, because there's a reason why Orioles fans are excited to, to have this as part of the deal. 40th overall pick of the Rays in 2019. And I know, you know, he wasn't this, you know, longtime pitcher. He was an infielder back in his, his college days for a bit. And what's kind of the, the scouting report on you know, what kind of pitcher he has developed to, because the one good thing is, he doesn't have as much mileage on his arm as a normal pitching prospect. For sure. Now you get mileage a lot on your arm when you're a shortstop anyhow. So I guess, you know, you could go both ways, but the, the nice thing with Seth is he kind of grew on everybody, like including myself at the beginning of, of the rankings, you know, going through a couple of years ago, I, we had him, you know, maybe in the close to twenties because he was so raw command wise. He really had shown a lot of potential with his stuff, uh, but control and command just weren't where they needed to be. Now, the, the one pitch he's always had going for him is, is a good fastball, along with a, uh, a really, really, really solid plus-plus uh, slider is what I would call it. Uh, um, he, that's the pitch that really puts him you know, on the radar as a, a floor of a relief pitcher, basically. So when you start with the floor there, you're like, okay, at a bare minimum, we're going to get him as a, a back-end reliever. You would hope with having a 70 grade -ish, um slider and about a, you know, just above average fastball with the potential to be even more if he gets the command down. So that was the knock on him was to get that command on the fastball to the point where he could actually attack hitters the way that, you know, you foresaw he possibly could. Um, the, the thing I would note on Seth is, is I had him ranked fourth in race system before the season started, just because I saw promise and, and, and a lot of promise in, in his change up in his uh, curveball, and, and so you could see that one way or, the, or another, one of those two pitches was going to be that third pitch that put him into a starting role. So he, it was showing enough tunneling to the point where hitters weren't able to really rally up and, and knock it around the way they used to before. So, and he was not putting as many of them in the dirt, not missing far enough away that they give up on it early in, in, in the pitch. So to me, that's what kind of put him in a different level, you know, for this year. Uh, so I had him and Taj Bradley before the season going, I could go with either one. I ended up going with Taj over top of him, but, uh, but all of the both of them were basically right behind Shane Boz as uh, as the three main pitchers that the Rays had that you know that you could actually put at the top of the rankings. And, and that's exciting too because we know how well the Rays have done with their pitching prospects, and the Orioles have done a good job kind of picking up the guys that the Rays can't hold on their forty man, as we've seen with Cole Salser and Joey Crable, and you know now in a little different sense with the trade. But with Seth Johnson, that's kind of gets to my next question, because kind of the big elephant in the room here from the race side is that he was 40 man eligible 
this offseason. We know nobody every offseason has a bigger 40-man crunch than the Tampa Bay Rays. And with the Tommy John, you know, obviously you can put him on the 40-man, you can get to opening day, and then you can put him on, on the 60-day injured list. But, you know, the Rays might not even have had that ability just because of the amount of guys they have to get on. So to give up him plus Murray for a guy like Jose Siri, how much of it, you know, trading him now was the injury versus the fact that he was injured and he had to be put on the 40 man roster this off season. Yeah. I, th- I think if he was, if he wasn't injured, it would have been a lot tougher to trade for, for Jose Siri the way they did. I, I think they would have had to go possibly position player route, like maybe even a Vidal Bruhan. Um, but because Seth Johnson and where the Orioles are in terms of what they're doing and building, I think the Orioles were also concentrating on pitching because they have such a strong position player, you know, core to work around. So it made sense on that front as well. So when you look at the raised pitching, I mean, the Orioles could have asked for John Doxakis or you have another guy coming off the injury bug, which is Cole Wilcox, who I really like. He becomes that guy instead of uh, Seth Johnson that'll kind of take over that role. But yeah, I think, the, the Rays did this last year where they had to take a bunch of their Tommy John guys and bring them back onto the roster, which is very painful when you're trying to protect that many prospects. But thankfully for them this year, they ended up not having a rule five. So they locked out. They got to save a whole bunch of talent that they would have lost. So for this year, it was going to be a double whammy. And, and I think they saw the, the writing on the wall where they're going to lose a lot of these guys and trying to trade Seth Johnson in a deal after the season before the, the the rule five would have been really hard to do, I think. Yeah. And, and, you know, a team isn't going to take him as much when, you know, they don't even get to start his rehab process with him. You're basically getting his Tommy John, rehabbing him a bit and then saying, here he is. And, and that would obviously scare a team off. And the Orioles are going to have to protect him. Obviously, you know, they've, they've invested Trey Mancini in him and yeah. another team would scoop him right up hold on to him and then put him on the 60 day injured list and then have Seth Johnson. So clearly the Orioles will protect him. Now, the last thing I have on Johnson for you is, you know, as a, as a Rays fan, you know, the Orioles hope that they'll get Johnson to the big leagues. I mean, hopefully in 2024, but I think we'll say by 2025, hopefully he'll be in the big leagues with the Orioles. So from a Rays perspective, what is kind of the, you know, nightmare scenario? What is the scenario where Johnson is hurting you in an Orioles uniform, kind of a roundabout, more fun way to ask, you know, what does, you know, the best outcome of when Johnson gets to the major leagues look like? Well, Grayson Rodriguez goes game one and, and Seth Johnson goes game two. I think that's that's the fear factor where you just kind of know that if they're scoring any runs and they're defending as well as they, it seems like they're going to be able to based on what you guys have. And you have a leader like Adley Rutschman leading both those guys. Uh, the, sky, the sky is really the limit with those two. I mean, you're, you're going to be able, and you have more than that, obviously. There are other guys that are going to come in the fray, but they're, it, it kind of gives you guys that depth you need behind Grayson Rodriguez that, that's going to be hard to compete against and, and, and basically allow your front office to concentrate on maybe pen issues and, and those kinds of things. So you, you definitely want, like if you're, if the Orioles are aiming for 2024, 2025 of really being true playoff contenders, having that depth of eight to nine to 10, you know, starting options uh, is the way to go. And Seth Johnson is going to be solidly in that pack. And the more competition you have between those guys, the better it is. And you're going to get to reap the benefits of the team. Yeah, the Orioles hoping that the, you know, the surgery goes well, the rehab goes well. Obviously, they'll be overseeing it all. And listen, he had 41 strikeouts and 27 innings in, in high A uh, before the injury. So the, the stats were obviously looking great before he went down. And, and a lot of people like this guy. And he, he slotted in on fan graphs as the Orioles' new number 12 prospect. So uh, I'm feeling good about that. And I think that's only because he's about to get Tommy John. If he were healthy, um, he, he'd be much higher up on that list. But Matt, you know, we had planned to just talk about Seth Johnson when we had scheduled this. And then... I still can't quite figure out why, but the Orioles picked up Brett Phillips. You know, he was DFA'd by the Rays. The Orioles make a trade for cash considerations to bring him in. And the reason I say that is because the Orioles probably deepest is one way to put it, but most crowded position on the major league roster is the outfield right now. Now they didn't trade Anthony Santander at the deadline, so they kept their starting outfield. So I guess my question to you, how would you you know, sell to an Orioles fan what Brett Phillips could bring to this team down the stretch, despite the fact that, you know, there's no way around it. He's in the worst hitting slump of his career, and, and it's certainly been an extended slump. 
So what I would say is that despite the, the worst hitting slump you could possibly imagine really for any player, the fact that the Rays gave him as, as long a leash as they did is a testament to him as a person and a player, because I don't think many people get that kind of credit. Well, what I would point to is that despite that, he's still an over zero F war player. And that's a, a testament to his D. And, and by trading away Trey Mancini, you've opened up a spot as DH for Anthony Santander. Uh, and then you can put Brett Phillips more often in the outfield. And if you look back at 2021, uh, Brett Phillips had the almost exact same production against right-handed pitchers as Austin Meadows. Uh, he had an 870 OPS over uh, 208 plate appearances. Now, uh, you didn't get, you know, an extensive amount of playing time. You know, that's less than than regular playing time, I guess is what you would call it. But it still shows the potential that he had. He had 12 home runs and 11 stolen bases in, in just those 84 games. So you're talking about a 2020 plus player. Um, if he can do that for those two months, you know, and give you guys the elite D he's already always going to provide in center field or even in right field, you guys are getting a, a player that can actually, you know, improve your production for your pitching staff. With the wall back and, and that better pitching staff, you're only going to get better and tougher to beat. So I, I think he's, he's a smart asset for you guys. Uh, I don't think it's a, a no improvement. Uh, now, hopefully he hits for you guys, but he's going to improve the, the clubhouse. You know, the fields were maybe down with Trey Mancini being gone, but Brett's going to amp that up, no doubt. He's not going to let you, the team get down in the, in the dumps. He's an all positive all the time, guys, so. For the Orioles, I think it's an extremely smart ad, um, and then it'll put you in good place for next year. Yeah, and, and you know you can at least think about an Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Brett Phillips defensive outfield. I yeah. doubt many balls are falling in. If uh, oh. even if that's just a late game eighth ninth inning, you know, situation that the Orioles have down the stretch. But Matt, thank you so much for joining us, telling us a little bit about Seth Johnson, who you know Orioles fans maybe uh, in a year and a half, maybe going back to listen to this episode again. Uh, when Johnson's, you know, a, a full go uh, at the beginning of the 2024 season. And of course, to talk about uh, the much beloved Brett Phillips as well. But thanks again for joining us. Not a problem at all. Anytime. So we'll get to our second conversation of the day. This time with Spencer Morris talking about Chase McDermott, who came over to the Orioles from the Astros in the Mancini trade. But first, got to tell you about Built Bar. And if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you aren't depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Are you ready? It's delicious, indulgent cookie dough. Mm, just thinking about it makes me hungry. It's covered in chocolate. That's right, Built has done it again. The cookie dough chunk puffs, they have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course, covered in 100% real chocolate. It's the first ever protein-infused marshmallow, and there are only 160 calories and a whopping 15 grams of protein in these marshmallows. It's the best healthy snack that still tastes absolutely delicious. And Built Bar still has the OG bars with all the great flavors that you can get at Built.com. So go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, so we welcome us. Well, wow, that was a terrible start by me. <laughs> We're restarting that. All right, so we welcome Spencer Morris back into the podcast. He's co-founder of the Diamond Dreams blog, covering all things MLB draft and prospects. Also writes for the Crawfish Boxes, covering the Houston Astros, and does a great job covering the Astros system specifically. And Spencer, first of all, welcome back into the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. And of course, we bring you on because of the big trade that kind of shook Baltimore to its core on Monday yeah. and was, you know, probably much less of a big deal. I mean, it, it was obviously nice for the Astros to get a, you know, a good bat like Trey Mancini, but you know, the reaction from Baltimore versus the reaction from Houston, very different. But of course the Orioles trade Trey Mancini to the Houston Astros as part of a three team deal, which saw Houston also send Jose Siri over to Tampa Bay. And one of the two prospects the Orioles got came from the Houston system. And that was right-handed pitcher Chase McDermott a 23-year-old who many felt was in the top 10 or close to the top 10 in the Astros system. So my first question to you is, 
where, you know, even if you don't have a specific top 30 for yourself, kind of what either tier, where did you kind of rank him in the Astro system before the deal? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I don't have an exact ranking right now, but I would definitely, I think even, even after the draft, I would definitely have had McDermott in the top 10 for the Astros. Um, I think pretty comfortably after Hunter Brown, he was the best pitcher in the system. Um, once uh, the, once it came out that Mancini was going to Houston, like the, I, I tweeted like before we knew the return that I hoped it wasn't going to be McDermott. Like I felt pretty secure that it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be Brown, but I was hoping we could hang on to him too. Um, he was a guy who they got in with the um, compensation pick for George Springer leaving. Um, went to Ball State, uh, was a three-year guy. One of those years obviously wiped out by COVID. Um, only threw about 40 innings as a freshman. Um, so obviously like the college track record was pretty short, but it was a pick that I liked a lot because um, while he's like, he's, he was a bit raw coming out of college for like a junior um, from a D1 program. Uh, he was super athletic. His brother uh, has been in the NBA on a couple different occasions. And while he might not be quite that level of athlete, he definitely moves like really well on the mound. Um, and even going back to Ball State, he was showing you four different pitches, I think all of which uh, can project his major league quality pitches. So there was a lot to like there. The strike throwing, um, definitely then as well as now, I think still needs some work. But uh, you talk about a guy with that level of athleticism, those are usually the ones who figure it out. Um, so I've had high hopes for him. I definitely think that he still has a chance to be a long-term starter. He will need to throw more strikes, but he has all the weapons that you could ask for against righties or lefties. And uh, I do think there's reason to believe that the location can get better. And even if it doesn't improve too much, um, you can pare the arsenal down and put him in the bullpen. He probably picks up, you know, a couple more miles an hour and then he's throwing about 97. So he projects pretty well there too. Um, just getting into, into like the arsenal a little bit more, the fastball, uh, I don't want to say it averages 95, but he's going to pop a lot of 95s over the course of the start. Um, he probably averages somewhere around 94, if I had to guess. Obviously, we don't have like full data on that uh, at the A-ball level, but um, it's definitely a firm fastball. It's got some good movement qualities to it as well. Again, I don't have like trackman data or anything but just from watching him on, on tv this year hitters are swinging under the fastball a lot um and he also will throw it uh, at the bottom of the zone too it's more of a, a called strike pitch there but it's been effective for him when he's locating um he the the secondaries he'll mix and match kind of depending on the night um, I think the slider is probably the best one overall, but uh, depending on the start, he might be throwing more curveballs. Uh, the slider I, I favor just because it has a lot more velocity. It's usually about 86, 87, um, but it still has plenty of movement to it. The curve is, is more of like the, the typical 12, six, about uh, 70, 79 or so. Um, he generally doesn't throw the change up as much, and I don't think it's really as good as the breaking balls, but uh, when he gets a good one, it can definitely look like a solid pitch too. Um, I think that's more important if he does continue starting. If he doesn't, it'll probably just be fastball breaking ball, but all of the pitches really project well for me. Um, and I think, you know, you can definitely end up uh, when he's done developing with having maybe even multiple 60s in there. Yeah. And, and you talk about, you know, the, the, the strikeout stuff is there. I mean, in, in terms of K rate, in terms of Ks per nine, not only in the Houston system, he's one of the best in all of minor league baseball so far this season yeah. at 14.3 Ks per nine. But as you mentioned, 5.4 walks per nine, you got to get that down. I was wondering, you know, you mentioned the arsenal. Is there a pitch where, because we know in the minors, you know, guys are still developing, they will throw a pitch they're working on and it can lead to some walks are there pitches where the command, you know, anything in his arsenal where the command really eludes him that leads to those walks? Or is he just kind of in general, a high strikeout, 
you know, high walk guy who, you know, what if he can get the command issues across the board down, you know, he, he jumps to that next level. Um, yeah, I mean, he's definitely, I, what I've noticed watching him this year, he's been throwing a lot of curveballs. I'm not sure if that's like necessarily his optimal pitch mix to be throwing as many as he is now. But um, additionally, I would say a pretty substantial portion of the walk problem, like does come down to the fastball. Um, he misses with fastball up quite a bit. I think that's like probably one of the the biggest things he needs to get over if, if starting is going to be realistic um, is just getting, throwing more, more consistent quality strikes with the fastball. Like he does flash some ability like to move it around the zone, but um, the consistency just isn't, hasn't quite been there uh, to this point. And, you know, I, I know he's got a 5.50 ERA. You can't take as much from that as you could from a, you know, major league ERA, obviously, but yeah. I also know some of that is where he plays because with the Asheville Taurus in high a, where he's been this year with Houston, I know that's known as a small ballpark. Now I will say they don't have an MILB TV feed. So, you know, I haven't been able right. to at least check in and see that ballpark. Does that ballpark really play? Because I've heard some people say, Oh yeah, it's a hitters park. And I've heard others talk about it. Like it's one of the smaller parks in the minor leagues and really hurts pitchers. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that it's like California League levels of of video game offense, uh, but it definitely has a reputation as a hitter's park. Um, I'm not sure like exactly where it falls on the spectrum. I haven't kept super up to date with with like the data on on the ballparks, but um, I would say like yeah, the the ERA really isn't indicative of of the way he's pitched this year. In general, um, when he's even like when his Location is even okay. Uh, he's overmatching hitters at that level for me. It's a lot of swinging strikes. Um, and I think you don't have to worry at all about the stuff translating up the ladder. It's just a matter of uh, if he's going to be able to get it over the plate often enough to be effective. And then the last thing is, you know, what do you see as, you know, we won't talk 100th percentile because rarely do guys really meet that. But what do you see as you know, good to very good outcome for him and the Orioles looking like, is this a mid rotation starter? Is this a, a back end guy? And, and also in terms of, you know, obviously the Orioles will have a different timeline than the Astros will, but I'm sure they'd like to get him to double a by the end of this season. So, you know, kind of combining, what do you think a, a good to great result looks like in terms of when he's in the bigs and, and, you know, what kind of role he could have on what the Orioles hope will be a pretty good baseball team, similar to what the Astros built over the last few years. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's not too hard to, to get to a number three starter projection with him. If the command is like a, a 45 and the stuff um, like, and the changeup improves a little bit as well. Um, I think it's pretty easy to envision that. And I want to say that I still see a lot of, of room to grow with him because of the athleticism, like we talked about earlier. Um, but one uh, one thing to keep in mind there is that he is going to be 24 years old in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, it, he is a lower mileage guy for that age, but still you, you do have to wonder even with as good of an athlete as he is, um, how close to his ceiling is he already? Um, so I think maybe the, the most likely outcome is in the bullpen, but, uh, if you want to get down to it, probably the most likely outcome for most minor league arms is in the bullpen. Um, I definitely still give him a shot to be a mid rotation arm. If, uh, if he can improve in it in a couple of areas going forward. Yeah. It, it did feel like, you know, that the Orioles at least, you know, I gave my thoughts on this trade, but in general, they got more than many thought they could get for a rental first base bat. So the last thing I wanted to kind of pose to you quickly is from the Astros side and you cover the system well, and also obviously cover the major league team. What were your kind of quick thoughts about, you know, did the Astros give up too much for Trey Mancini knowing, you know, he's obviously not going to hit third for the Astros and lead them to a title. He's going to be a good supplementary piece, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what, what did, did they meet the price? Did they, you know, spend too much for getting Trey? And it's a little tough because it was a three team deal also, but. At the end of the day, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it made sense to to move Siri and even to move McDermott just because he's he's not going to be pitching in the majors this year, probably next year either. Um, 
and I definitely, you know, agree with uh, the decision to go and get a, a slugging first baseman. Um, I, I liked, you know, basically all the names that they were connected to kind of in the rumor mill, whether it was going to be Mancini or Bell or Walker. Uh, I felt like it made sense to add one of those guys. Um, the, the dream scenario would have been to come away with one of them without giving up McDermott or Yiner Diaz. Uh, they hold on to one out of the two. Honestly, I probably would have rather traded away Diaz than McDermott, but who knows if they even had that option. So uh, I'm happy. I mean, I think they, they made their team better. And when, when you have the kind of big league team that they do, you have to take all the opportunities that you have to do that. Yeah. And it was certainly interesting to see, you know, Mike Elias make a deal with his, uh, with his old buddies in Houston. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I'm sure he had, you know, his eyes on people. And I'm sure those, those conversations were certainly more interesting than uh, some others on deadline day, but Spencer, thank you so much for joining us. I will say we probably talked about a, you know, no, no shade to Ryan Hartman. We've probably talked about a more interesting pitcher <laughs> long-term uh, in yeah. this episode, but thanks again for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was fun. So our thanks again to both of our guests today, Matt Germain and Spencer Morris, for joining us to talk about the return in the Trey Mancini trade, the two right-handed pitchers, Seth Johnson and Chase McDermott. We do know that Johnson underwent successful Tommy John surgery on Wednesday, so his rehab starts now. Again, as we talked about with Matt, I wouldn't expect him to be pitching an affiliated ball with the Orioles until the beginning of the 2024 season. Matt made a good point that he'll be ready you know, fully to go, you know, in spring training of 2024, that's still a long way away. But again, you know, he was in Matt's mind, a top five prospect in the Rays system. That's a top five system in baseball. You know, again, I still don't like that the Orioles traded Trey Mancini. I've made that clear, but what I will say, and what many have said for a player like Trey Mancini, a, you know, basically rental first base slash DH, the Orioles did get a pretty good return Two pitchers, who are both slotting in in the top 15 of the new Orioles prospect lists at, at most places. And two guys who could be, you know, number three or four, or maybe even higher starting pitchers in a couple of years when they get to the big leagues and definitely two exciting pitching prospects. Again, I would rather still have Trey Mancini on the team, but I hope these guys do well because it was a pretty solid return. For Trey Mancini, I got to say, I did not think, and one of the reasons why, there were many reasons I didn't want the Orioles to trade Mancini, but one was I didn't think the return could be anything close to this. So at least in that sense, good on Mike Elias for, for getting some, some solid return for Mancini. But for the Orioles here on this podcast, you know, without Trey Mancini, they are 3-0 and now after a sweep of the Rangers. But I'll be back with you for one more episode here on the pod coming up on Friday, of course, we will do a quick preview of the weekend series against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Orioles back at home at Camden Yards for the 30th anniversary of the ballpark that forever changed baseball celebration. I'll preview Orioles and Pirates. We'll get you some Orioles news and notes, some draft pick signing news, some injury news. Talk about some of the quotes from Mike Elias with the media on Wednesday. And then we'll take a closer look at the return the Orioles got for Jorge Lopez. The four minor league pitchers they received from the Minnesota Twins in that deal. And Seth Stowes, who is the founder of Twins Daily, covering all things Twins minor leagues, is going to join us to talk about which of those four pitchers could be impact arms at the big league level down the road for the Orioles. But that's all coming up on tomorrow's Friday episode to finish out the week. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.